9 p.m. A Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you a thrilling dramatization of the unforgettable story, The Devil and Daniel Webster, on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight's story, as well as those we will present every week, was chosen from the whole world of fiction, from the best works of fine writers, by one of the world's most popular authors. His knowledge of stories that will grip your imagination and stir your emotions is universally recognized. For he is the author of such wonderful novels as Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Random Harvest, Lost Horizon, and many others you have loved in books and on the screen. Hallmark is proud to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For our opening story on the Hallmark Playhouse, we have selected Stephen Vincent Benet's The Devil and Daniel Webster. It happens to be a classic, and I'm partial to classics. And it honors American tradition as well as a great American, and I'm partial to them, too. It even gives, gives the devil his due. But the real reason we chose it for this opening program was because we like it, and we hope you like it. It's not only a great story, it's a good story, if you get what I mean. In fact, we might all of us settle once and for all on our rather simple requirement for stories in this program that they shall be good enough to give you good entertainment. That being so, they can be anything else they want to be. Indeed, we have the bookshelves of the world at our disposal. From the pages of the most skillful storytellers, old and new, we shall try to bring you adventure, romance, fantasy, excitement, comedy, now and then a tear or a mood that stays. For the fine teller of tales does just that. He slips into your heart and leaves you something to think about. Yes, Mr. Hilton, like the thought left behind by your own lovable Mr. Chips. The simple request he made of his pupils when he said to them, Think of me as I shall certainly think of you. Yes, I remember him saying that. We think they are significant words, Mr. Hilton, because they express as well as any we know the reason for remembering to send Hallmark cards. For there is a Hallmark card for every occasion on which you want your friends to know you are thinking of them. Hallmark cards say just what you want to say the way you want to say it. Won't you remember to look on the back of the card for those three identifying words, a Hallmark card. They tell your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Mr. Hilton, we're ready for tonight's story. One of Stephen Vincent Benet's favorite figures in American history was Daniel Webster, and he wrote at least two stories about this famous American statesman and the legends that surround him. Here is his story of the devil and Daniel Webster. It's a story they tell in the border country, where Massachusetts joins Vermont and New Hampshire. Yes, Daniel Webster's dead, or at least they buried him. But they say that if you go to his grave and speak loud and clear, Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster, the ground will begin to shiver and the trees will begin to shake. And after a while, you'll hear a deep voice saying, Neighbor, how stands the Union? Then you better answer... The Union stands as she stood, rock bottom and copper sheet, and one and inv indivisible. Or he's liable to rear right up out of the ground. Daniel Webster, a man, but something more than a man. A legend, but something a great deal bigger than a legend. There are thousands that trusted in him right next to God Almighty. And they told stories about him that were like the stories of the patriarchs. But the biggest case, he argued, never got written down in the books. For he argued it against the devil. Nip and tuck and no holes barred. And this is the way it used to be told. There was a man named Jabez Stone. Lived at Cross Corners, New Hampshire. He wasn't a bad man, but he was an unlucky man. When he planted his fields in corn... The borers ate them before they flowered. When he planted potatoes, 
the blight rotted them in the ground. On the day I'm telling you about, he broke his plowshare on a rock. And the same afternoon, his cow dropped dead. And that night, when he went out to have a look at his horse. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, where are you? Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, where are you, fella? Oh. Oh, Tom. Cold. Stone cold. The cow and now the horse in one day. I swear it's enough to make a man want to sell his soul to the devil. And for two cents, I'd sell mine, too. Cheap as stone. Cheap as stone. Cheap as stone. What was that? Did someone call? Is someone out there? Jane! 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 What is it, darling? Oh, Jane. What on earth is wrong, David? Why did you bolt the door? I thought I heard. I thought I heard. Heard what? When the thunder crashed, I thought I heard someone call me. Thunder? What thunder? Well, the thunder just now. Well, I didn't hear any thunder. You didn't hear any thunder? No, dear. You must have imagined it. Oh, I hope I imagined it. Dear God, I hope I imagined it. <laughs> All the next day, Jabez Stone kept glancing over his shoulder as he went about his work. A growing uneasiness prowling inside him that would not be stilled. And sure enough, just after supper, a soft-spoken, dark-dressed gentleman drove up in a handsome buggy and asked for Jabez Stone. You sent for me, I believe, Mr. Stone? Well, uh, not, not exactly. I... Not exactly? <laughs> Come, Mr. Stone, the tones were most exact. And unmistakable. Sorry I couldn't get here last night, but I'm on the road quite a bit, you know. I was busy in Europe. Who are you? I'm usually called Scratch, hereabouts. Name's as good as any. Oh, yeah. We'd better walk out behind the barn. My, my wife might see you. <laughs> as you like. Dogs don't like me somehow. It's rather sad. We've never had a dog down there. I... Uh, when I said that last night... You know, I... this could be a very profitable farm. Location is excellent. With a little influence, properly applied, you could become a very wealthy man. Hey, let's sit on the fence. Take a look at it. Mm-hmm. You know what I see when I look around me, neighbor Stone? I see fields of plenty and a new barn. I see fat cattle and sleek horses. I see a fine house. And I see you, a prosperous gentleman, surveying your domains. How does that sound to you? Oh, it sounds like heaven. Ah, it's not precisely the most appropriate word for it. In any case, it wasn't heaven that you called in for help. Well, I, I didn't call on you for help. Pardon the contradiction, neighbor Stone, but you did most insistently. Well, let me see. The price mentioned was uh, two cents, I believe. Of course, we'll raise that. I don't believe in driving a mean bargain. Suppose we make it seven years of prosperity. Seven years? Of all the things you ever wanted for your wife and your children for seven years. Prestige, position, money. Well, I, I don't know. I could hold you to the original bargain, you know. I could give you the two cents and take your soul right now. But I've had a good week, and I don't mind letting you get the best of me. You'll have everything you want for seven years, neighbor Stone. I've worked so hard, I, I had such good intentions. <laughs> well, you know what road is paved with good intentions, Jabers. Here, give me a hand. Let's seal the bargain. I, I never thought I'd make a bargain with them. No, no, most men don't. But you'd be surprised how many of them are glad to do it when the shoe begins to pinch a little. Poverty becomes such a tiresome bedfellow. Come, neighbor Stone, I have business elsewhere. Give me your hand. Now, I'll just prick your finger with this pin. One drop of blood and the bargain's official. There we are. Now, if you'll just put your signature to this document... Here's a quill. Better wrap your handkerchief around it. You may find it a little hot to handle. Uh, sign on the bottom line, please. Very good, neighbor Stone. Very good indeed. Well, I'll be on my way. Is, is it dawn already? Time goes fast in my company, Jabers. Very fast. Very fast. Very fast. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh. 
is gone. And I don't know whether I've gained the world or lost it. David, where have you been all night? Oh, out here, thinking. What? Davis, what's this bag on the ground? Bag? That's odd. It's warm. Give me that. Let me see it. Well, what is it? It's gold, Jane. It's filled with gold pieces. Gold? Well, where did it come from? It's mine. Yours? Where would you get a bag of gold pieces? It's mine. Mine, mine. Mine. Uh, no, Jane. Here, take it and spend it. Buy whatever you want. Javis, I don't want any part of that money. No part of it? Oh, Javis, give it back. Wherever you got it, give it back. I, I can't. I've accepted it. I can't give it back. All right, Javis. I, I'd better be seeing to breakfast. But Jane! I'll call you when it's ready. Then I've lost the world. I've lost the world. <laughs> of Hallmark Greeting Cards, America's favorite greeting cards, are bringing you The Devil and Daniel Webster by Stephen Vincent Benet, a story selected for you by James Hilton on the Hallmark Playhouse. Now let's go back some 200 years to an 18th century drawing room in London. The occasion is a literary tea. Several elegant men in knee breeches and powdered wigs and women in billowy skirts and lace caps are gathered around the guest of honor. This is the man destiny has marked as the greatest of all English painters. Through sheer, untutored genius, he has astounded the world of art and letters with the unique quality of his work. But William Hogarth, despite his greatness, is a simple man. And so, when he is asked a question concerning his genius, and the room grows quiet awaiting his answer, all he says is this. Genius is nothing but labor and diligence. Yes, in addition to real talent, it does take real diligence to make the difference between what is ordinary and what is outstanding. And the folks who make Hallmark cards never forget that this is true. That's why so much painstaking care goes into the expression of even the simplest sentiment created by the makers of Hallmark cards. You see, they're not making just cards. They're making Hallmark cards, greeting cards that are warm and friendly and sincere. Cards that say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. That's why Hallmark cards are America's favorite greeting cards. And that's why those three identifying words on the back, a Hallmark card, tell your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now James Hilton presents the second act of a great story by another famous writer, The Devil and Daniel Webster, by Stephen Vincent Benet. <laughs> We're midway in Stephen Vincent Benet's story of the devil and Daniel Webster. The spell is laid, the charms wound up. Jabez Stone is enjoying his years of prosperity. Daniel Webster is making up speeches to use against John C. Calhoun. And old Scratch is counting off the years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh year, the year of reckoning. Listen. It was morning of the last day of the seventh year, and Scratch came up through Jabez Stone's lower fields, switching his boots with a cane. I was just looking over the property, neighbor Stone. I trust you have your affairs in order. I'll be here to get you promptly at the hour of midnight. I'm not going with you. I won't go. You can't make me go. Oh, won't you, neighbor Stone? You'll find that I'll carry your soul off in this handkerchief as simply as though it were a butterfly. Put that handkerchief away. Leave me. Get out of my sight. Leave me. Until midnight, Chambers. Until midnight. Oh, what shall I do? Who can I turn to? What can I do? He stood there, one man, alone and terrified, looking into hell. And then, then, like a cool, peaceful hand resting for a moment on his soul, the thought came to him. Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster. I'll go to Daniel Webster. I'll go to Daniel Webster. Well, that's the whole.
old story, Mr. Webster. I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you, for you coming with me. I, if anyone can help me, I know you can. Well, well, neighbor Stone, if two New Hampshiremen aren't a match for the devil, we might as well give the country back to the Indians. Well, it's almost midnight. I'm sure he'll be prompt upon the hour. Wouldn't you, uh, wouldn't you like to wait in the parlor? No, indeed. A New England parlor is too cold for me, but I love a New England kitchen. Well, he'll be here any moment. <laughs> Relax, Jabez. Sit quiet. Enjoy the fire. Oh, Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, I should never have brought you here. I didn't realize what I was doing. Suppose he were to get you, too. Harness your horses and get out of here. Well, I'm much obliged to you, neighbor Stone. It's kindly thought of, but there's a jug on the table and a case in hand. And I never left a jug or a case half finished in my life. Uh -huh. I thought your clock was a trifle slow, neighbor Stone. Well, let us admit our distinguished visitor. Well, Mr. Webster, I presume. Attorney of record for Jabez Stone. Come in, sir. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Good evening, neighbor Stone. Uh oh You don't seem to be in very good health, neighbor Stone. But a warm climate should do wonders for your condition. Oh. I'd like to see your document, Mr. Scratch. Certainly, I have it right here. Mm hmm? I'm sure you observe that it's in good order. Very well. I've seen enough of it. Well, now, Mr. Scratch, suppose we offer to compromise this case. Compromise it? Mr. Webster, you astound me. Why should I compromise when I'm legally entitled to all? The property has increased in value since this was signed. Mr. Stone is now up for the state senate. State senators are worth more than this note calls for. A state senator is worth no more nor less than any other man. I admire your spirit, Mr. Webster, and your efforts on behalf of your client. But I'm rather pressed for time. Pressed or not, you shall not have this man. Mr. Stone is an American citizen, and no American citizen may be forced into the service of a foreign prince. We fought England for that in 12, and we'll fight all hell for it again at any time it's necessary. Foreign? And who calls me a foreigner? Well, I never heard of the death of your claiming American citizenship. And who with better right? Am I not in your books and stories and beliefs from the first settlements on? Am I not spoken of still in every church in New England? <laughs> It's true, the North claims me for a Southerner and the South for a Northerner. But I'm neither. I'm merely an honest American like yourself and of the best descent. But to tell the truth, Mr. Webster, though I don't like to boast of it, my name is older in this country than yours. Very well. Then I stand on the Constitution. I demand a trial for my client. Well, the case is hardly one for an ordinary court, and indeed the lateness of the hour... Does... Let it be any court you choose, so it's an American judge and an American jury. Let it be the alive or the dead. I'll abide the issue. Agreed, Mr. Webster, agreed. The alive or the dead, you say? Very well. We'll take the dead. Who comes at this hour? The jury, Mr. Webster, demands. You must pardon the rough appearance of one or two. They will have come a long way. Take your seat, gentlemen, over there on the right. May I introduce the jury, Mr. Webster? Walter Butler, the loyalist, who spread fire and horror through the Mohawk Valley in the time of the Revolution. Simon Gertie, the renegade, who saw white men burned at the stake and shouted with the Indians to see them burn. Governor Dale, Morton of Marymount, teach the pirate, John Speak the Strangler. I won't bore you with further identification. I'm sure you'll recognize most of them, and all of them played a part in American history. Well, are you satisfied with the jury, Mr. Webster? Quite satisfied. Good. You wanted a justice, I believe. I bring you Justice Haythorn. A jurist of experience. He presided at certain witch trials once held in Salem. There were others who repented of the business later, but not he. Oyers, 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 this trial is now in session. Justice Hawthorne presiding. Oyers, Oyers, Oyers. Proceed, Mr. Scratch. Your Honor, I can state the case briefly. I have here a document which calls for Jabez Stone to deliver his soul unto me at midnight this night. Jabez Stone has seen fit to engage Mr. Webster to question the legality of this document. I therefore submit the deed which you will find in good order. I object. Your Honor, Mr. Scratch is trying to influence the jury by establishing... Objection. Since we have established that the deed is in good order and the signatory is that of Jabez Stone, I request the jury to find for the plaintiff and deliver Jabez Stone unto me. Jury finds for the plaintiff... Court dismissed. Oh, come, sir. This is ridiculous. Am I not even to be heard? Is my client to be given no voice at all? Surely even in hell there is some form of justice. We believe in the letter of the law, Mr. Webster. 
a man sells his soul, he cannot claim it back. And there's no use attempting any appeal to our hearts. That is our least vulnerable spot. I wouldn't dream of it. But you're a gambler, Mr. Scratch. And as a gambler, you surely wouldn't want to miss a challenge. Challenge? Do you think you could move this jury? I don't know. But let me gamble for the soul of Jabez Stone. And if you lose, what sticks do you put up? My own soul. Ha! Well, Mr. Webster, now you do tempt us. Speak for your client. Gentlemen of the jury, I ask you to remember for a few minutes that you once were men. For though a devil can never know what it is to live or to die, a man can never forget it. I ask you to remember all the good things of living and how those things sicken and die without freedom. You of the jury are Americans. You two played a part in this country. Perhaps now, looking back, it isn't the part you wished you had played. For the knowledge of personal failure and lack of honor must be the greatest agony of any hell. But you were Americans. And you saw the seeds of liberty sprout and begin to grow. Somewhere during those days, each of you lost his way. There was no chance for you to go back and attempt to make up for the things you've done. But now, you can't let one man return from the edge of hell and start over for himself and for you. Gentlemen of the jury, I ask you to look at Jabez Stone. There he is. One ordinary, blundering American who had a run of hard luck and wanted to change it. Don't let him be punished for that through all eternity. Gentlemen of the jury, I... I beg you, remember what it is to love the one spot of land that each man calls his home. Remember what it is to love the one woman who tends your heart fire. To hold your children within your arms. To plan and to dream and grow and live. Remember what it is to feel the wind of New Hampshire on your face and the earth under you and the red blood singing in your veins. Remember the sound of the word liberty and how that word caught fire and blazed until it became a light and hope and warmth to an entire world. Gentlemen of the jury, remember that you were Americans and are still Americans. And that this man who stands before you is of your flesh and of your dreams and of your soil. And you and only you stand between him and the devil. The defense rests. Jury will retire to consider its verdict. The jury has considered its verdict, Your Honor. We find for the defendant, Jabez Stone. Perhaps it's not strictly in accordance with the evidence, but even the damned may salute the eloquence of Mr. Webster. <laughs> They're gone. They're all gone. Well, I won't say that I'm pleased about the verdict, but nevertheless, my congratulations as between two gentlemen. I'll have Jabez Stone's contract, if you please. Yes, Mr. Webster. Uh, now then, as regarding the costs of the case, I want a document promising never to bother Jabez Stone or his heirs or assigns nor any other New Hampshireman till doomsday. For any Hades we want to raise in this state, we can raise ourselves without assistance from strangers. It is done. Here, glance it over. You'll find it in good order. Mm, thank you. 
Yes, this will do nicely. Well, you certainly get things done in a hurry when you want to, don't you? The resources of evil are infinite, Mr. Webster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you long-barreled, slab-sided, lantern-jawed, cloven-footed note-shaver. Be off with you. Be off to your own place before I put my mark on you. Well, if you insist. Good night. Goodbye, Mr. Stone. And Mr. Webster, I don't suppose we'll be meeting again, but say uh, la vie. Say la vie. Good night. Mr. Webster, I, I'm never going to be able to thank you. Well, now let's see what's left in the jug for its dry work talking all night. I hope there's pie for breakfast, neighbor Stone. <laughs> Well, we got the best of old scratch. <laughs> story of the devil and Daniel Webster, and they say that whenever the devil comes near Marshfield, even now, he gives it a wide berth, and he hasn't been seen in the state of New Hampshire from that day to this, thanks to Daniel Webster. In a moment, James Hilton will return, now that Daniel Webster has taken care of the devil and put him in his place. So, in one big jump, we leave the devil and open the gates of heaven. That is, the children's heaven, because I want to tell you about the Hallmark Doll Collector's Album. Children are going to have more fun than ever collecting Hallmark dolls now that there's a lovely new album to put them in. It gives you a new and inexpensive way to make some child very happy. And during this introductory period, the album is only 25 cents when you buy one or more of the Hallmark dolls. You'd expect the album alone to be worth a dollar, but you can give your little boy or girl or some little friend the Hallmark Doll Collector's Album with three beautiful Hallmark dolls in it to start a collection for only one dollar. It's a wonderful and truly different gift that will make any child's heart leap with joy. Then later, you or friends and relatives can help complete the entire collection of 16 colorful Hallmark dolls. The dolls are as easy to send as any Hallmark greeting card and cost only 25 cents each. And each new doll added to the collection will mean a new thrill for a child. So stop in tomorrow and see this new album at the store where you buy your Hallmark cards. Remember, the album with three dolls in it to start the collection is only one dollar. Now here again is James Hilton. I think you'd like to know that Daniel Webster was played by John McIntyre and Mr. Scratch by Alan Reed, two of Hollywood's finest actors in two very fine parts. Now next week, ladies and gentlemen, we present for the first time on the air a delightful romantic comedy by Douglas Welch called Mrs. Union Station. I won't try to tell you what it's about, but I'll say this much. We've certainly been having fun getting it ready, and I'm really looking forward to it. So until next week, this is James Hilton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway. The music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. To be doubly sure of the finest quality, always look on the back of your cards for those three identifying words, a Hallmark card. Hallmark cards are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Next Thursday night, James Hilton presents his story selection for the week, the first radio performance of Mrs. Union Station. So until then, this is Frank Goss saying good night to you all. This program has come to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.